You're in the water loop. <laughs> Hey, this is Travis with Waterloop. I want to tell you a story about High Sierra Showerheads, who I'm proud to have as a sponsor of this podcast, particularly because they make incredibly water-efficient showerheads. I've talked with owner David Malcolm about growing up in California, learning about the importance of water and energy efficiency from his father. David has been designing high-efficiency nozzles for agriculture and golf courses for the past 30 years. The golf course people actually came to him wanting a nozzle that produced a uniform spray but was water efficient. So David went in and designed a nozzle that explodes a low pressure stream of water into a shower of large powerful droplets. David actually thought this would make a great shower head and that's how High Sierra Shower Heads was born. And nobody has their nozzle technology. It's patented and you get a great shower while saving water. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. An issue, an episode about PFAS today, something that is a very hot topic, has been for a while, is not fading, is really important for us to talk about. I'm joined by two folks from Duke University. I have Heather Stapleton, a professor at Duke, and I have Lee Ferguson, an associate professor at Duke, both very much involved in some PFAS research and studies and monitoring. Uh, thank you both for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So if somehow the listeners or viewers have, are not really familiar with PFAS, could uh, one of you provide a, a kind of quick overview of, of PFAS and why it's a concern? Um, okay, I guess I can start, and then Heather, if you want to jump in. Uh, well, PFAS are a class of compounds that are really defined by the presence of carbon-fluorine bonds. And so uh, for an organic chemist, we know that this makes these compounds really super strong. And from an environmental standpoint, what it means is they last a really, really long time. So they've been tossed around as forever chemicals. Uh, they're used in all kinds of applications, including stain repellents, firefighting foams, they're quite ubiquitous. And so over the years have uh, been become really emerging as a concern for human exposure as well as for environmental exposure. For humans, uh, in, in many cases, the primary exposure can be through drinking water. And so there's been lots of attention paid to these for water quality. And as uh, I'm sure we'll talk about during this uh, podcast, North Carolina has been uh, really sort of an epicenter of PFAS concern. Um, from a number of standpoints. Yeah, and so let's segue into that. I think uh, I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina, and we are one of the, the epicenters for a PFAS story with Gen X, uh, a PFAS compound that was uh, put into the Cape Fear River for about 40 years by a, a plant uh, up in the Fayetteville, North Carolina area. This was just really discovered about three years ago in 2017. And so that obviously sparked a lot of questions, a lot of inquiry, a lot of concern. And I believe that was what led to a statewide monitoring program to look at PFAS around North Carolina. Um, could you talk about, about that effort and connections maybe that you all have to that? Um, sure, yeah, I, I can, I can kind of discuss um, how that started and what we found to, to, to start with and then maybe segue. Um, well, so uh, as you said, the discovery of Gen X and some of the related compounds in the Cape Fear watershed and specifically in Wilmington's drinking water back in the 2016, 2017 by Mark Streiner at EPA and Detlef Kanapi at NC State. This really kicked off quite a lot of attention to that area. Uh, one of the results was the formation of a consortium called the PFAST Network in North Carolina that really encompasses most of the major universities um, around the state focused on examining PFAS in all of the municipal water sources for the state of North Carolina. So myself and Dr. Kanapi at, at NC State have uh, been working really hard the last couple of years to generate a map uh, and a distribution of all PFAS uh, that, are, that are in the water supplies across the state of North Carolina. And perhaps if I could, I could show uh, some of that initial data um, to maybe get the conversation started. Sure. 
Well, so uh, this is sort of a summary of all of the data uh, that we've generated so far. Um, so all of the water stations are along this, this side here. And then the bars along the horizontal axis are the concentration of PFAS. And so just for uh, reference, this dash line is sort of the threshold level for EPA's health advisory level for PFAS and PFOA. And so if you focus in on sort of the top of this, you can see all of this sort of purple uh, is essentially the compounds that are related to Gen X. And most of these sites up here should be familiar to, to folks in Wilmington. These are areas uh, down in the, the Wilmington, uh, lower Cape Fear area. And so you can see the concentrations here up to 400 parts per trillion, uh, pretty high. And this compares to some data from the, uh, the, this is national data from the Environmental Working Group. And you can see that even in their uh, data, Brunswick County, North Carolina, was one of their highest, as was their highest PFAS uh, level that they measured. Uh, and if you take a look, you know, it really kind of leads um, levels that were found across the country. If you drill down into sort of what, what this looks like from a statewide uh, perspective, here's the map. Um, and what we, what we see here is really kind of an interesting story. Uh, Western North Carolina is actually pretty um, low in PFAS. Uh, so blue is, is really low PFAS, red is really high PFAS levels in the water supply. So Western North Carolina and much of Eastern North Carolina that gets their water from drinking or from uh, groundwater wells is also pretty clean. You see this sort of line of red right here, red and orange, and that's the Cape Fear River and then the Haw River up in the sort of headwaters. And this whole center of North Carolina here has sort of these intermediate orange levels of PFAS, total PFAS. Uh, and so what you see is this sort of story of a sort of uh, intermediate exposure potential for central North Carolina, uh, including, you know, the Triangle, the Triad and other communities, and then relatively high exposure down in the lower uh, Cape Fear. Um, and so uh, this sort of shows um, something that I'm, I'm really trying to prime Heather here for some discussion about what's happening in the Haw River. This is Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And one thing we noticed is that at the very beginning, when we started monitoring these water supplies, we had relatively low concentrations for most of the PFAS at this site on the Haw River at Pittsburgh. But then when we went back months later, we saw that the concentrations had really increased, especially for these, these purple compounds here. And this really led to a lot of, of attention and, and interest in what's going on in the Haw River, uh, where these compounds are coming from. And so maybe Heather uh, could, could talk a bit about that. Sure. Yeah, it was uh, based in large on the uh, PFAS, the research being conducted by the PFAS network. Um, we, we became really interested in understanding uh, PFAS exposure in the research triangle area. Um, and our group in particular was interested in also in evaluating the uh, effectiveness of water filters in the home for removing PFAS. And so as part of that, we were sampling drinking water, tap water from various utilities in the triangle that included rock. Raleigh and Durham and Chapel Hill, Cary, Apex, uh, and Pittsboro. Uh, and that's when we realized that the levels in the Pittsboro drinking water were definitely elevated. At one point, we measured concentrations in the actual tap water up to 760 nanograms per liter. And as Lee pointed out, the EPA health advisory is around 70 nanograms per liter for PFOA and PFAS. So this really spurred an interest in understanding, you know, how they were getting into the Haw River. So the Haw River is the source of the drinking water for the city of Pittsburgh. And, um, and this followed up on some earlier work that Detlef Canapi's group had done in the area back in 2007 and 8, where they also had measured mm -hmm. some high levels in that area. So it seems to us that this elevated exposure, or elevated levels in the Haw River have been going on for some time, possibly back to, you know, 12 to 15 years ago. Um, so in 2018 uh, and then in 2019, we began more intensive sampling in the Haw River. Uh, and that's going on currently. So we're collecting weekly samples at 13 different locations along the Haw River, trying to understand the spatial and temporal variability in the PFAS levels that we hope will provide some insight into the point sources, or at least the relative contributions of sources to this community. Uh, in addition to, to looking more closely at the Haw River, we're also trying to work with the Pittsburgh community to understand what this means for their exposure. I think there's a lot of questions in Pittsburgh, but also elsewhere in North Carolina about what does this mean that these chemicals are in my body? Um, are they, can we measure them in my blood? And what does that mean for my health risks? So to try to, to answer those questions, um, we recently conducted a study in Pittsburgh where we 
asked people to volunteer and participate in a research study where they provided uh, a sample of their drinking water from their home and um, met with us and allowed a phlebotomist to collect a blood sample so that we could analyze the blood and their drinking water for PFAS. And we just recently uh, released those results and returned the uh, sent reports back to the participants. And to summarize what we found, basically, we did detect these chemicals in the bloodstream of everyone that participated in our study, living in Pittsburgh, and the levels were elevated relative to the general population. And depending on which PFAS we talk about, levels are either two to five times higher than what we see on average in the general U.S. population. So we do believe that this elevated exposure is coming from their drinking water. And so we hope to follow this up in the future to understand what this means for health risks. And we really can't say at this time what this means for health risks. But um, I know a lot of people have seen the movie Dark Waters, right? This Hollywood blockbuster with Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway. And that movie is based on real life events that occurred in West Virginia, where a community was exposed to PFAS chemicals from a manufacturing facility. In that study, they did find an association with several health outcomes, including cancer and thyroid disease. Um, so these are questions I think that are, are at the forefront in people's mind in North Carolina. So we're hoping we can continue to, to address these questions and conduct further research so we can help answer these questions for the community. Yeah, I've got a bunch of follow-ups to that there. So there's, what are the, what's the speculation on the sources of PFAS in that Haw River watershed? Any, any ideas, any preliminary data or what kind of, how's that look? Sure. Um, our preliminary data to date uh, indicates that some of the PFAS input uh, is coming from a wastewater treatment plant up near the Burlington area. Um, so we see we've been collecting samples directly upstream and downstream of this wastewater treatment plant, and we can see an increase in concentrations you know, over a very short segment of the river. It's only a couple hundred meters apart, so it seems likely that they could be coming from that plant. Um, and in that case, we see there's four or five different PFAS in particular that are elevated, but not all of them. Some of the PFAS are the same at those locations. So that suggests that it's a site further upstream on the Haw River. Um, so uh, it's also possible there could be land application of biosolids uh, that are used heavily in agricultural fields. And then during rainfall, they can run off into the adjacent rivers or they can penetrate the groundwater. Um, so we're trying to understand whether these uh, there could be additional sources. Um, but we do think wastewater treatment plants are likely a source for the Haw River. Um, and it's possible that there are industrial users of these chemicals. Like we have a lot of textile manufacturing in North Carolina, furniture manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's possible these industries are uh, releasing these chemicals into their waste and they have a permit to discharge to this wastewater treatment plant. So that might be one of the sources or one of the explanations how they're getting into the wastewater treatment plant uh, in the first place. And so it's going to take us more time to kind of you know, understand where they're coming from exactly. But we, we do hope to answer that question. Yeah. Well, that was a, a key point you made there that the wastewater treatment plant itself isn't the source. There, Those right. chemicals are coming from someplace upstream and, and kind of being right. fu funneled into that that spot and then discharged into the river. Um, and on the, on the health front, uh, um, what's the, I guess, community reaction when you're doing this type of study on a, on a high profile topic that has health concerns? Um, there's gotta be kind of outreach and communication components. Uh, what, what's done on that front and, and how are the communities reacting? Certainly. Um, well, I can tell you the number one question we had from a number of our participants when we returned the results was does this mean that I'm at a higher risk for cancer? Um, and that's a very difficult question for us to answer right now. Uh, we know in other studies they have seen an association with cancer, um, we, but it is important to note that the levels of exposure in Pittsburgh are not as high as what was observed in West Virginia in that community discussed in the movie Dark Waters. That's It's about a couple fold lower than what was in West Virginia. Um, the, we have spoken to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, and they do have a cancer registry, um, and they've been trying to examine the data to determine if there appears to be elevated rates of cancer in that area. Uh, their analysis rely on county-level assessments, so if they look at the rates in Chatham County, uh, they don't see any elevation of cancer rates in, in Chatham County, although it's important to, to recognize that Chatham County is a very large county, and it's really just Pittsburgh in that county. So 
We're hoping in the future maybe they can look further at the rates just in Pittsburgh relative to other counties, but that's going to take some time. It's a very complicated process to run those statistical analyses. What about other parts of this overall PFAS exposure study? I think there's some some things happening with uh, even animal studies as part of this to try Mm -hmm. to learn more. Yes. So we were working with some uh, colleagues at Duke University, uh, some toxicologists. And so what's what's important in terms of evaluating health risk is not looking at one chemical at a time, but the mixtures. So PFAS are found in mixtures, particularly in the drinking water in Pittsburgh. Um, and most health studies conducted to date have looked at risks for individual chemicals. So we want to ask a more environmentally relevant question. Well, what are the health risks from exposure to these mixtures of PFAS? So working with colleagues at Duke University, we're actually conducting some animal studies where we're actually creating a water sample that mimics the PFAS fingerprint or signature in Pittsburgh and then allow these animals to be exposed to it over time and understand if these animals develop certain health risks, particularly looking at um, effects on early life development, fetal development, um, you know, growth, effects on uh, lipid, what we call lipidomics or effects on cholesterol levels. Mm. Uh, several studies have suggested that ex- high exposure to PFAS is related to higher cholesterol. And we know high cholesterol is associated with a number of uh, cardiovascular diseases. So um, we're trying to kind of dive deeper into some of these questions in an animal study, but trying to mimic what the people of Pittsburgh are exposed to. Mm-hmm. And this, this PFAS exposure study is not complete. There's pieces of it still ongoing. Um, on, on the study of the waterways, Lee, um, where where does that stand? Are you still gathering data? Still have more pieces you want to want to determine? Or yeah, sure. Yes. Um, well, so that is an ongoing study. We've been put back quite a bit by uh, the COVID um, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, primarily because it impacts our ability to go out and actually collect the samples from the water supplies. Uh, so we've been moving now to a model where we're sending out sampling kits and trying to get the samples back uh, directly from the, the public utilities. Uh, so basically, we finished um, the first round of sampling that we were mandated to do, and we're about halfway through the second round of sampling. Uh, and so the idea was to sort of canvas the state twice uh, to see how much, how much variability there might be. And so that was the data that I just showed you from the first round. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that we're really uh, focused on is using some new technologies called non-targeted analysis and high-resolution mass spectrometry, um, which is a bit of wizardry that might be familiar to people when they they see uh, something like CSI or NCIS in the laboratories where they sort of just put the sample in the mass spec and up pops all of the molecules. Uh, Well, so it doesn't really work that way, unfortunately, but, but we can get close. And so we're trying to use those kinds of approaches to sort of discover what PFAS compounds we might be missing uh, by just focusing on particular compounds that are sort of in standard methods or, or that sort of uh, technique. So, so that work is ongoing and we've discovered some interesting things even so far, um, compounds that are derived from firefighting foams. Um, what this really allows us to do is a more detailed forensic um, look at sources. So, you know, the question often is, where do these PFAS come from? Certainly that's the the question in the Pittsburgh case, but elsewhere as well. So if we fingerprint using some of these high-res methods, we can actually get some forensics on where the sources were. You mean what they show on TV like that is is sensationalized and and not real? (laughs) Um, I I wish. Uh, (laughs) Oh, that's very interesting, though. So... What's the sense uh, among, uh, you know, statewide, especially among advocates or the environmental community about what's being found in the different waterways? I guess there's some some sense of relief in parts of the state, the western part of the state, the northeastern, where there's very low kind of levels. Um, obviously, the concern is in that central area, then the Cape Fear River corridor. I think there's been an absolute thirst for data uh, over the last uh, years. And so we've in part been able to quench that thirst for areas that just have been completely ignored uh, for PFAS analysis. And so I think that um, advocates and water keepers uh, have have been perhaps happy with that. However, I I do think that there's been some concern 
about why this sort of statewide monitoring approach has not been instituted by the state agencies. So in some ways, perhaps it's not ideal to rely on universities and university researchers to sort of guarantee the water quality of uh, your state. Um, and so what I think should happen, and I'm hoping this will happen, is that there'll be more of a partnership between the universities and uh, the DEQ, for example, and perhaps the federal government uh, to, to do this in a way that's more amenable to regulation. Um, right now, I mean, we're researchers. I'm not a, I'm not a, a regulator. I can't enforce anything, um, even with my kids. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but certainly, um, if we partner with regulators, then I think that we'll have great science and the ability uh, to, to really, um, you know, regulate. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, my, my perspective, having universities uh, do the research and do the science is, is awesome. That's as credible as it gets. You know, you guys go in there and you know what you're doing, but I can see how that partnership approach would be really valuable. And that, that leads me, I guess, to kind of one of my big questions is um, we, we get the, the information on the, the waterways, on the health and the community exposure, and then what happens with all this? That's not decisions you guys make, but I, I think you're, part of this is also looking at policy areas uh, and potential approaches and so forth. Is that right? Yeah, part of the, um, the Duke Collaboratory PFAS project is uh, working with the Nicholas Institute for, for Environmental Policy Solutions um, to see if we can develop some strategies or thoughts about the best ways to, to remediate or to address this problem. Uh, so in particular, we hope to work with the city of Pittsburgh to either provide some guidance and suggestions on whether they maybe change where they pull their water from. Maybe we don't pull from the Haw River. We look for a different source. Um, there's also a lot of questions uh, that are starting to uh, be asked about how this information affects home property values. Mm. Um, and we want to be able to provide some information with regards to what we know about those questions. Um but I think, you know, I, I just wanted to come back to the lease uh, response earlier, too. I think working with stakeholders is going to be really important moving forward because what we want to do is get these chemicals out of the water so they're not in the drinking water anymore, right? Right now, everyone's taking these steps to buy these really expensive filters and put them in their home because they don't want to be exposed. And what that's going to do is just increase these this dichotomy between who's exposed and who's not exposed based on who can afford to put these filters in and. We really need to work with the stakeholders to identify how they're getting into the rivers in the first place. Um, and that's going to take a lot of time and patience and open communication with the, uh, the state of North Carolina. And I think it's important because our data really suggests that up to 10% of North Carolina's population has this elevated exposure. If you consider the number of communities between Pittsburgh and Wilmington that are pulling their water from this source, either the Cape Fear or Hot River, that's a lot of people in North Carolina uh, that could be impacted that has this elevated exposure. So we need to be thinking quickly about solutions and what we can do now. If I could just add to that just real briefly, I think sure. one of the important points that I'll, I'll play off one of Heather's points about removing these compounds from the source. Um, you know, we exposures don't happen in isolation. So if you take a sample from the Haw River, uh, sure, you can see PFAS, but that doesn't mean there's nothing else there. Uh, so there are many compounds that aren't PFAS, which enter waterways through the same routes. Um, and, and in many cases, we just don't know what those are. So being able to use PFAS as sort of almost an excuse or, or a, a bellwether, a canary in the coal mine for removing uh, emerging contaminants from water, I think would be a huge win. Um, so in some ways, uh, I think that if we can remove PFAS, then there's a lot of other things uh, that get removed as an ancillary benefit. And I think that that's something that we don't talk enough about, um, sort of the, the uh, chemical soup uh, that we're exposed to and, and ways that we can uh, sort of reduce exposure. Well, I know, you know, here in Wilmington, they're spending $43 million to put in a granular activated carbon filtration, right, to really take, I think, reduce those Gen X PFASs by like 90% or something. Um, that cost comes to ratepayers like me. Um, but, and I think that across the river, maybe in Brunswick County, there's a utility looking at putting in a reverse osmosis system, which is even more expensive um, and, and has issues with, well, you've got to then deal with that the discharge. But um, that's a tough solution out there. But those are things, like you said, that 
remove a lot <laughs> of other things from the water, but come with a, a pretty big cost as well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, uh, I appreciate the time from both of you and, and the information about this exposure study and just a look at, at PFAS around the state of North Carolina in, our, in the waterways. Um, look forward to following up and, and tracking uh, as, as the research continues and gets concluded. So um, thank you both so much. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop Podcast is brought to you by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart and stylish way to save water, energy, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code Waterloop for 20% off at HighSierraShowerheads.com. You're in the Waterloop. You're in the Waterloop.